Good morning, and welcome to Acuity Brands Fiscal 2020 Second Quarter Financial Conference Call. After today's presentation, there will be a formal question and answer session. To ask a question, please press the star, then one key on your telephone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Pete Shanine, Vice President, Investor Relations and Corporate Development. Sir, you may begin. Good morning. With me today to discuss our fiscal 2020 second quarter results are Neil Ash, our President and Chief Executive Officer, Darren Holcomb, our Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Ricky Reese, our Executive Vice President and President of Acuity Brands Lighting. We are webcasting today's conference call at acuitybrands.com. During this call, we will also discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations to comparable GAAP financial measures can be found in our second quarter press release and 10 QSEC filings. I would like to remind everyone that during this call, we may make projections or forward-looking statements regarding future events or future financial performance of the company. Such statements involve risks and uncertainties such that actual results may differ materially. Further, forward-looking statements speak only as of the date they are made, and we undertake no obligation to update publicly any of these statements in light of new information or future events. Please refer to our most recent 10-K and 10-Q SEC filings in today's press release, which identify important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those contained in our projections or forward-looking statements. Now, let me turn this call over to Neil Ash. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you today to talk about acuity. Obviously, we all wish the global context were different right now. We are embarking on the next generation of acuity. As we start on that journey, we are dealing with the shocks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we manage through the current situation and begin to change our company for the future, we do so with a strong financial footing, with a market-leading position in our core business, and with a strong team to navigate the company through this. Given that we're new together, I want to outline what we will cover today. First, I will give you some perspective on our second quarter performance, and Karen will go into more detail about the financials. Then, I will cover how we prepared for and how we are handling the shocks related to COVID-19. I will provide you with some of my initial observations of the company, talk to you about digital transformation, and give an outline of who I think Acuity is and can become. For consistency, we will continue to discuss the business and present metrics that you have traditionally seen for at least the remainder of this fiscal year. Following our opening comments, Ricky Reese will join us for the Q&A period. Our second quarter performance was a mixed bag of continuing trends with several signs of improvement. After a very weak December, the business picked up in January and February, and we began to see real traction, specifically in our independent sales network channel which represents over two-thirds of our sales, and was up over 4% for the quarter, inclusive of TLG. Some of the business and product highlights included success with our contractor select products. Sales grew at 30% this quarter. We successfully launched Modulus Technology. Modulus is a proprietary and innovative low-voltage distributed power and control system for LED luminaires, enabling design flexibility, greater connectivity options, and lower installation costs. And the integration of TLG is progressing as expected and is accretive to our performance. Those were balanced by some of the same dynamics that you have heard from Acuity in the past. We continue to face year-over-year revenue declines in retail as a result of our changed home center strategy and in corporate accounts as a result of the timing of relight projects at several large retailers. We expect these dynamics to continue. We also saw revenue declines in direct sales of industrial and infrastructure accounts primarily due to large projects in the prior year that did not repeat. Despite that revenue performance, we were able to expand gross margins year over year and to generate strong cash flow, both of which demonstrate the adaptability and durability of our core lighting business. With that, I'll turn it over to Karen for more details on the financials. Karen? Thank you, Neil, and good morning, everyone. I know many of you have already seen our results, but I would like to make a few comments on the key highlights for the second quarter of 2020. Net sales for the second quarter were $824 million, a decrease of 3.5% compared with the year ago period. Overall, net sales volume declined approximately 7%, while the price mix of products sold was favorable this quarter by approximately 1%. 
We estimate price mix was impacted by a favorable shift in channel mix, partially offset by an unfavorable mix of products sold. The positive change in sales channel mix was mostly influenced by the decline in net sales of lower margin products sold primarily through the retail channel, partially offset by product substitutions to lower priced alternatives, primarily for more basic, featured, lesser featured LED luminaires sold in certain channels, as well as declines in shipments for larger commercial projects, a historical strength of the company. Acquisitions added about 3% to our growth. In addition, we believe the demand in the second quarter for private non-residential construction in general, and more specifically lighting, was down in the low single digit year over year percentage range. We believe these declines were due in part because of the continued concerns over global trade and economic issues. We do not believe that the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on our second quarter results. From a channel perspective, there were a few key areas of significance. First, net sales through our independent sales network, which makes up approximately 72% of our total net sales, increased 4% over the prior year. Our performance compared with the year ago period was impacted by the contribution from acquisitions, market share gains in certain lighting and controls categories, and growth in our contractor select portfolio. Additionally, our building management solutions platform at DISTEC performed well again this quarter. The impact of these items was partially offset by continued weak demand, primarily for larger commercial products, projects. Second, net sales through our direct sales network were down 16% over the prior year's second quarter, due primarily to the completion of certain larger infrastructure projects in the year ago period. Third, lower shipments in the retail channel resulted in a decline of 23% in this channel as compared to the prior year's second quarter. The decline in this channel was primarily due to the impact of previously announced actions taken by the company to exit and phase out of certain products whose profitability was most negatively impacted by the additional tariffs. As we mentioned in previous earnings calls, we expected these efforts to result in lower net sales and more favorable gross profit margins. Lastly, net sales in our corporate accounts channel were down almost $20 million this quarter compared with the year-ago period, primarily due to the completion of certain projects in the year-ago period that did not repeat this quarter and, to a lesser degree, slower releases for certain renovation projects. As we have noted in previous earnings calls, we expect net sales through this channel to be inconsistent based on the nature of the construction cycle of the customer served, primarily big box retailers. In the second quarter of fiscal 2020 and 2019, we had some adjustments to the GAAP results, which we find useful to add back in order for the results to be comparable. In our earnings release in Form 10-Q, we provide a detailed reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures. Adjusted results exclude the impact of manufacturing inefficiencies, acquisition-related items, amortization expense for acquired intangible assets, share-based payment expense, and special charges for streamlining activities. We believe adjusting for these items and providing non-GAAP measures provide greater comparability and enhance visibility into our results of operations. We think you will find this transparency very helpful in your analysis of our performance. Gross profit was $344 million, up approximately $10 million from the year ago period. Our gross profit margin for the second quarter was 41.7%, an increase of 260 basis points compared with the year ago period. The increases in gross profit and margin were primarily due to the benefit of acquisitions, favorable channel mix, and lower costs for certain inputs, partially offset by the impact of lower net sales, as well as the higher cost due to the enacted tariffs. Reported operating profit was $81 million compared with $96 million in the year-ago period, while adjusted operating profit for the second quarter of 2020 was $102 million compared with adjusted operating profit of $112 million in the year-ago period. Reported operating profit margin was 9.9%, a decrease of 130 basis points compared to the prior year. Adjusted operating profit margin was 12.3%, a decrease of 90 basis points compared with the margin reported in the prior year. Our FD&A expenses increased approximately $23 million compared to the year-ago period. 
the increase in SD&A expense was primarily due to the addition of costs from acquired businesses, including higher employee costs and amortization of intangibles, increased commissions, higher professional fees, and higher variable incentive compensation. Our adjusted SD&A expenses were up approximately $20 million, or almost 9%, compared with the year-ago period. The effective tax rate for the second quarter of fiscal 2020 was 23.4% compared with 23.1% in the prior year quarter. We currently estimate that our blended effective income tax rate before discrete items will approximate 23% for fiscal 2020. Our diluted EPS for the second quarter of $1.44 was 23 cents lower than the prior year. Our adjusted diluted EPS this quarter was $1.84 compared with $1.99 reported in the year ago period. The decrease was primarily due to lower pre-tax income. We continued to have a positive cash flow from operations and ended the quarter with a strong balance sheet. We generated $250 million of net cash flow from operating activities during the first half of fiscal 2020, which was up $26 million or 14% compared to the prior year. At February 29, 2020, we had cash and cash equivalents balance of $381 million, a decrease of $80 million since August 31, 2019. Our total debt outstanding was $406 million at February 29, 2020, and we currently have additional borrowing availability of approximately $396 million under our bank credit facility. The bank credit facility and term loan mature in June 2023. We clearly are pleased with our financial strength as we enter this uncertain time due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, and I will turn it back to Neil. Thanks, Karen. Obviously, the effects of the coronavirus pandemic have turned the world on its head. I'll spend a few minutes updating you on what has happened and what we have been doing about it. I'll begin to say by saying how pleased I am with the company's resilience, beginning with the supply shock when China went on lockdown. As China began to shut down, we were able to use our preferred position in the industry to gather additional supply. Other than some specific finished goods inventory products, we so far have been able to largely buffer our customers from the effects of the supply shock. As companies are forced to reevaluate their supply chains, we can report that our diversified supply chain has performed well. As the potential worldwide ramifications started to become clear, we began to work, work to prepare our people, facilities, and operations for what would come next. Our priorities were and are the health and well-being of our people while addressing both the risks and opportunities that the situation presents. Beginning in late January, we started making changes in our manufacturing and distribution facilities to ensure the health of our associates and the continued operation of our facilities. We re-engineered the people flow in our building to create more social distance and to limit the number of people that any one person could come in contact with. We also changed the sanitation procedures to proactively eradicate as many contaminants as possible. At the same time, we have been working with various jurisdictions to respond to their directives to help slow the spread of the disease. In almost all instances, we have been deemed an essential business and remain open. However, we have scaled back some less essential parts of our business to spread out our operations and to reduce the number of associates that we have in our buildings. So far, the vast majority of our manufacturing and distribution facilities are operating at the capacity necessary to meet demand. We were also able to transition our other functions to completely work from home. As a newcomer to the company, I was amazed at the seamless transition. We made the decision to work from home on a Monday, and on Tuesday, it was business as usual. Our product and go-to-market teams and our enabling functions transitioned overnight from all together to completely virtual. We also transitioned our communication with our channel so that we could effectively conduct business. We have been able to continue our important product work and to maintain our communication and alignment with our important independent sales network through this transition. From a financial perspective, we entered the shock with a solid, solid balance sheet, as Karen discussed. We have taken steps to ensure that we are prepared for as many scenarios as we can imagine. Our priorities have been to ensure our liquidity and to use this as an opportunity to make our company stronger after the event than we were going into it. We are scaling our variable costs to respond to the changes in demand 
and we are reevaluating our fixed cost investments as well. None of us can predict exactly how this will play out over the coming months. With that in mind, we are taking responsible actions in light of the current downturn in demand, but that do not inhibit our ability to rebound when things return to normal. With that, I'll talk about what we all expected to be talking about on this call. I took over as CEO on January 31st. I'd first like to thank Vern for his outstanding leadership of the company. He led the transformation of the company from a diversified conglomerate to a market-leading lighting business that has led many of the technology transitions in the industry. I've spent the last eight weeks getting to know the company and our people and working through this crisis. I have visited all of our largest facilities, some multiple times. I've met and worked with many of our talented associates. And here are my initial thoughts. Our lighting business is an industry leader. Our lackluster performance of the, over the last few years obscures the underlying strength of our go-to-market, product development, and supply chain operations. Our lighting business can compete effectively at the top, middle, and bottom of the market. The recent revenue trends, however, will not fix themselves. There has been industry deflation. We have additional work to do on our business and product portfolio to position us for future growth. We cannot and will not take for granted our market leadership position as we evaluate future trends and competitors. Our independent sales network is and will continue to be a strategic differentiator for Acuity. Acuity has led many of the technology transformations in the industry, and we need to continue to do so in the future. Our existing technology businesses, including Atrium, have potential, but we have real work to do to realize it. We have a very talented team of can-do, will-do people who work well together. They are and will be the foundation of our future success. Our business model is adaptable and durable. We have the ability to generate cash and to continue to deliver efficient returns on our committed capital. Now let me spend a minute on digital transformation. Although digital transformation has become one of the trite, overused, and ill-defined terms of late, the reality is that every company that was not originally digital needs to adapt itself to what is a fundamentally different world. In a sentence, what used to be a push-based world is now a pull-based world. And through this lens, Acuity is a push-based company in a push-based industry in a pull-based world. Acuity is no different from other successful companies. The better, we were, the, the better we were and what got us here, the harder it is to adapt to this new world order. We can and will adapt acuity to these new realities. I have had the opportunity to lead digital transformations at some of the largest and most important companies in the world. In my experience, this process has four key components, all of which apply to acuity. Transformative customer experiences. Everyone has new and expanded expectations. Business model transformations. We need to understand the whole value chain and adapt our business models accordingly. Using technology to improve business operations. Data can simplify and accelerate the business and run like a digital company. We can capitalize on the tools and methods of digital companies to be faster and more effective. As I've gone through these transitions at Walmart, CVS, and CNET, there are two things that have been true. First, in all instances, the core business has gotten stronger as a result of the changes. The second is that by building from and adding to the core business, we have created larger, more vibrant companies. You may have noticed that we changed our boilerplate in this release. This will begin the process of defining the acuity for who we plan to be. We have the opportunity to be a market-leading industrial technology company. We already have leading or developing leadership positions in lighting controls and building management, in addition to a market-leading lighting business. We have the potential to be a leader in location-aware applications. Through the necessary changes of our digital transformation, we can improve our existing businesses and their market competitiveness. We can continue to develop new businesses that are focused on defining the future of the industry. Those changes will strengthen our current business model. We will continue to be a strong cash generator. We have the opportunity to use that cash to grow our company through reinvestment and acquisitions. In conclusion, we have a strong company in a period of great change. 
We are aggressively managing to the uncertainties caused by the COVID-19 crisis. We have the financial strength and resolve to get through this and also to emerge a stronger company. Over the long term, we have the opportunity to more broadly adapt the company to expanding opportunities in our core businesses and to develop new ones. We have the market position, the people, and the cash flow to become a larger, more dynamic company that delivers for our customers, our associates, and our shareholders. With that, I'll pause and open it up for questions. As I mentioned, Ricky Reese will be joining us for the Q&A period. As we transition to questions, I'd like to both acknowledge and thank Ricky for his contributions to Acuity and his outstanding work in his new role as president of Acuity Brand Play. Operator, we are ready for questions. In order to provide everyone the opportunity to ask questions, the company asks that you limit your questions to two per caller. If you have further questions, simply reinsert yourself back into the queue and your additional questions will be answered as time permits. Our first question comes from Ryan Merkel with William Blair. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks. Good morning. So first off, uh, Neil, you mentioned opportunities that COVID presents. So I'm curious, where in your business do you see revenue opportunity and where do you see the biggest challenges? Thanks, Ryan. Um, as I said, we're trying to deal with both the, um, the, the challenges and the opportunities. So the, the challenges are obvious as you scale the business um, appropriately. We feel like we entered this period with, a, with developing momentum around our product portfolio in the core lighting business. And we have the opportunity to continue that process as we, as we emerge from this. So um, the combination of the strength of our supply chain as we've been able to manage and, um, and have consistent supply through this process as well as some of the new product uh, portfolio that we've been rolling out give us momentum for, uh, for the whenever we emerge from this. And we, we think those are real opportunities. We also think there's uh, opportunities to, uh, to do some of the hard work under the covers that we need to do to evolve the company. While we can't solve those uh, and make those changes in, in months, um, we can get a little bit of a head start while, uh, while, we're, uh, while we have folks that have more time on their hands than they would have otherwise. Got it. Okay. And then maybe just on the bigger challenges that you see, you know, I think the retail segment um, is, is a big, you know, big market for you. Are you seeing push-outs and cancellations there? Is that an area that we should expect to be pretty weak? So on the retail side, uh, obviously I've got a, a, a new set of eyes on, on the situation here, and we're going to evaluate the, the retail side for the long term and for the short term. And so let me address the long term question first. So, so we're evaluating the customers that we reach with our products through the channel uh, generally and trying to get a better understanding of who exactly we're serving through that channel and, um, and how effective they feel like they're being served through that channel. And so we'll go through that process. Um, specifically on the, um, on the short term, uh, we've seen fairly consistent uh, results so far, um, but we expect, the, um, we expect the demand shot to, to flow through them as well. We just don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Got it. Okay. I'll pass it on. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Our next question comes from Christopher Glenn with Oppenheimer. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, Neil, good to hear you on your first call. And, um, you know, you discussed improving uh, the existing business and the adaptability. I'm just curious, in your view, uh, maybe this question's a little early, but to what extent might this entail a fundamental margin reset over time? And if so, what are your views on enacting such an adaptation, you know, quickly or slowly? Thanks, Christopher. It's good to be with you. I, I, um, it, that's an obvious question that we're in the process of, of evaluating. We, uh, and I do think it's too early to, uh, to call. Um, I, I would take a step back, though, and say that one of the things that attracted me to this company was the, um, was the strength of our business model and its adaptability. So as we think about kind of where we want to be two, three years from now, we obviously want our lighting business to, to be beating the market, and we want it to be the most efficient 
uh, company in the market. And the exact implications then on how we uh, potentially restructure the income statement a little bit over time um, are still to be determined. We, um, we've been, I've been pleased what I, with what I've seen so far about our ability to, uh, to develop products, to, uh, to engineer them to the appropriate margins, to compete at the, the low, middle, and high um, uh, parts of the market. Um, as, an, as an outsider, I, one of the first things I wanted to understand was how effective we were at competing at each one of those, at, at each one of those sections of the market. And I think our contractor select performance is demonstrating that we can compete effectively in, in pretty much any product scenario. So then as we think about kind of what our long-term revenue makeup is going to be based on customers we target and products we offer, um, that will be the ultimate determinant of how, we, um, of how we manage that income statement going forward. And our priorities will be to get to a position where we can be a market leader with um, with more predictable revenue growth and um, an appropriate return on our capital. Uh, thanks. That's really helpful. And then just kind of, kind of a bookkeeping question for follow-up. Uh, the uh, S adjusted SDNA was up about $20 million year over year, I'm guessing maybe 5 or $7 million from the acquisition. So, you know, in, in this demand environment where your revenues are contracting, can you – just uh, contextualize the growth in the SDNA. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll treat top it, and then if you want more specific uh, answers, Karen uh, can jump in here when I'm done. But um, the big picture that you're 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 right. Most of that was the um, was the impact of of the acquisitions. So both uh, TLG and Locus Labs, which um, which rolled into this period. And then some, um, and then some incentive compensation and other things that um, that were uh, natural as a result of, of the second quarter performance. Um, as we're thinking about kind of the um, the changes that we're making as a result of the crisis, uh, I want to emphasize kind of what I said earlier, which is that we're going to um, we're managing obviously the variable costs uh, aggressively, and it's worth saying out loud that the variable costs don't manage themselves. So that's that's hard work, and we're on it. We're also taking a look at the distribution of our fixed costs so that, um, so that we're positioned for where we, uh, we want to be going forward. Um, that, that work is ongoing, so, um, so we'll continue to, to, uh, to take a look at that um, through, the, through the period. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Lee with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for taking the questions. Um, I guess um, you know, kind of staying staying on the the topic of the day, the um, you know the, the recession the recessionary environment we're entering here. I, I know it's still very fluid, Neil, but as you think about um, you know framing the potential downside here for the market, if we take 2008 to 2009 as context, there, there was a roughly 20% decline in revenue for Acuity uh, during that. Um, downturn, why or why not would this downturn be, um, you know, less severe? And I guess that's in the context of just, you know, a lot of your end markets right now, commercial office, hospitality, it seems like those are seeing the most uh, shut down um, and restrictive policies from stay-at-home uh, mandates. So just wondering if you could frame for us a bit how, how this compares to, to the last downturn of 08-09 when, when revenues were down 20%. Yeah, I'll start and then I'll I'll kick it over to you, Ricky, since you were actually you actually lived through the 0809 downturn and can provide kind of direct comparison. Um, I, I'd say the way we're starting to we, we've been modeling this, Brian, is we've been trying to think about it in terms of months and um, and depth and of, of decline. So um, this has been sort of a it's almost like a series of rolling brownouts is the way I would describe the demand as we're seeing it across the. Of the market. Obviously, um, we have continued to to to, uh, to to write orders and to sell, and um, a lot of what we've been supplying is for important things, from you know from field hospitals to uh, to, to government facilities to uh, to other infrastructure projects necessary to get through this. 
And so we've seen a range, we've modeled a range of outcomes by month that, um, that are, could be really steep, and, but we don't know for, uh, for how long. And, uh, you know, the comparison to the 20%, as, I, as Ricky, as I kick it over to you, really depends on how long the, the shock lasts and, um, and how we can come back out of that. And we, um, we don't have a crystal ball. Uh, Ricky, you know, you want to pick it up from here because we're, we're thinking about both on the, on the, the top line and, and how that might evolve. Yeah, a, a couple of comments that I, I, I would add that I think are, are, are different this time, both for the, the type of the recession as well as uh, where we are positioned. First, on, on the type of recession, the depth may be as deep, we, no one knows, as what we saw in 2008, 2009, but most people believe it won't be as protracted. Uh, you know, that uh, big recession, you know, lasted for, you know, two years or so, 18 months, two years before you saw a recovery. Most people, uh, no one knows, but most people believe this one will maybe not a V-shape, but that we will see a rebound once this uh, situation passes, and hopefully we have uh, uh, opportunities to treat this and vaccines and so forth should we see a rebound. Um, the other difference this time, I believe, is there is liquidity in the market. The last 2008, 2009, uh, there was a pretty significant financial crisis, a lot of liquidity lost out of the market and so forth, both from what the federal government has done as well as just the state of the, the financial markets. I think there will be more liquidity this time and the infrastructure uh, spending bills that are being put forward and passed uh, seem to be uh, more implementable and maybe more shovel-ready than what we experienced in 2008, 2009. Time will tell, but I do think those are different. Looking at us as a company, in 2008, 2009, 80% of what we sold was into new construction, and, and clearly new construction uh, has – uh, the biggest uh, potential for the impact uh, in, in many of the sectors. Uh, this time, only about half of our revenues would be into new construction. We're much more uh, into renovation, uh, much more into uh, uh, other aspects than just new construction, and those areas have the potential to rebound quicker than new construction uh, might might do. And then, as Neil said, and just a comment, uh, somewhat on uh, the questions earlier from Ryan. Uh, while retail stores and all may be down, we are seeing good activity in distribution centers and logistics centers and so forth as people now are uh, buying more and more online, being delivered. So we're seeing good opportunities and aspects of the, the business uh, beyond uh, the front-facing retail stores. So. Uh, Still hard to know where it's going to play out, not to su suggest by any means we're not going to see uh, a negative demand shock. We certainly think we will, and we're planning aggressively for that. But I do see some uh, stark differences and, and potentially positive from this one versus 2008, 2009, Brian. Great question. All right. No, appreciate that. That's, uh, that's super helpful context. Um, second one for me, and I'll, and I'll pass it on. Um, uh, just on, on tier three, tier four sales, uh, I, I, I might have missed it, but did you break out what the percent of sales in the quarter was or what the growth in that uh, category of products was um, year on year? And then I guess just as a segue into the into the question, um, Neil, I know a big part of why you joined the firm um, is around sort of digital transformation opportunity, and, and given your background, you obviously have a lot of experience with that. As you think about, you know, you know beyond COVID-19 and sort of um, uh, as, we, as we move into more of a normalized environment, whatever that may be coming out of this, do, do you see kind of um, at a high level uh, a need to sort of pivot the strategy around information given, you know, what might be the fallout in the retail environment? Uh, I know a lot of the initial rollouts have been with that community of customers, but are, are you thinking about it any differently? I know we're only about three or four weeks into this pandemic, but uh, it seems like the, the retail and markets would see the most amount of um, transformation potentially coming out of this and wondering how that might impact the strategy around your, um, 
you know, your digitalized approach in, in Tier 3 and Tier 4 specifically. Yeah, Brian, I'll, um, I'll, I'll chew on, on some of that, and then um, Karen or Ricky jump in here at the end with, uh, with any specifics that you feel like I left out. So, um, I, I, Brian, just to start where you finished, I, I, think it's, I think it's undeniable that this will be one of those events that after which nothing will be exactly like it was before. So we are, um, as we imagine kind of the strategy for the company going forward, we are um, we are mindful that um, that we expect there to be pretty major changes uh, coming out of this. To uh, to spend a second again on digital transformation, I think one of the the things that um, po people often do is think that digital transformation is is somehow using technology in the organization, which is why I went through the four things. But it's really what we do and how we do it. So. You picked up on the strategic part. As we think about kind of what services we can provide with our technology to uh, to other to other endpoints, both retail and otherwise, it really falls into uh, to, to two buckets, which is we can either be in the business of mark, moving market share, or we can be in the business our our data can be in the business of moving market share or delivering efficiencies for our uh, for our partners. So, um, so as you think about kind of the technology that we've obviously rolled out in retail first, there are real opportunities to do both in those, uh, in, in those categories, and those needs will probably be more prescient after this than they were before this. The efficiencies necessary also will translate into other, um, into other examples. Ricky mentioned the impact in, um, in industrial facilities and the opportunities that that presented. I was in our Just Plains uh, distribution and manufacturing facility, and we run Atrius in that facility to, uh, to manage all of the materials in that. So, um, so we have, a, we have a, 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 an app that we use there that manages uh, or evaluates the productivity of forklifts. It's uh, on the face of it, it's a small thing, but it's a window into the different ways that um, that this technology can be used. So, um, so I think it's a truism of technology that um, the impact is overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term. And I think our location aware applications that we're describing here will continue to uh, will take a, a longer than we expected to realize, but the the potential opportunity may even be larger than we originally uh, expected. And then second, um, on just kind of the general technology evolution, um, I would say that like at all parts of the business, both the lighting part of the business and then the um, the controls and, and and other kind of and ultimate location where applications, will continue to walk themselves up a technology curve. So the, um, I often describe technology companies as there, it's really not about ones and zeros or about technology products, but about really the, the length of the product life cycles. And so as we shorten those product life cycles, we can be continually moving customers and products up the curve of, of technology. So that will help happen. We expect, we all expect that to continue to happen in our in our core businesses, both the lighting businesses and the um, and the control businesses that we've historically you know lumped into into tiers. So big picture, I think that it's going to take a while, and it might be slightly different, but the the uh, on the you know kind of location aware applications. But big picture, they're about they're about data that either moves market share or creates efficiencies for customers and companies. And they have applicability in multiple different verticals over time. Uh, feel pretty confident about that. And that our controls business can and will continue to be a, uh, a grower and, a, and has real market uh, opportunity. Richard, Karen, do you want to add in to any of those specific answers? Just a couple of comments from me and then Karen, you may want to provide some of the specifics on the the percentage of sales and growth at Tier 3, Tier 4. But I will say Tier 3, Tier 4 continues to be a focus. The solutions we're building uh, that are much more than just the Atrius, we, we do have uh, uh, the networked uh, energy-focused type solutions that we sell. The, the unified system is getting traction and so forth. So I'm actually pretty excited uh, on the development and all side of Tier 3 and Tier 4. Uh, obviously, the 
current situation may slow down sales of those products, but we are going forward launching some new solutions into that tier three, tier four world, leveraging some of the technology we got with recent acquisitions, but also further integrating the businesses and the technologies that we have. Examples is a single room control we'll be launching here later this year, a very exciting product that I think will be well accepted as a way to very efficiently commission a single room control that would be code compliant and provide the energy savings. So a lot of activity continues in tier three, tier four, and we see it as a good growth engine for us. And specifically, our tier three, tier four sales are consistent with what we've reported before. They're about the 15 to 20 percent range of our revenues. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Brad. Our next question comes from Deepa Raghavan with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Hey, um, good morning, all. Uh, Neil, hello, welcome, and look forward to your leadership. A um, couple of questions from me. Um, can you talk about the order book performance towards March end and how that compares versus February or even your negative 7 percent volume growth this quarter? Um, what I'm more um, looking for is any sensitivities around how to think about upcoming quarter just given the job sites being closed could mean that even renovation projects are being impacted. Yeah, Ricky, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you pick that one up. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We are seeing uh, probably all the different things you might expect. We are seeing some, some markets where the construction sites are shut down, so obviously we're not shipping product into those. We have other parts where we're seeing projects being accelerated. Uh, so we are shipping uh, ahead of uh, when we might have otherwise as they're trying to get product in uh, ahead of any uh, disruption that may occur in the supply chain. Uh, we're uh, seeing business as usual in some parts of the country. All to say that the impact in March has not been significant. Yes, we've seen a bit of a slowdown, but it hasn't been significant, and I think the strong performance, and I want to give my thank you to our supply chain team and our suppliers and vendors that we've been able to continue to provide that supply and, and uh, continue on. We though certainly expect as more construction sites get slowed down uh, and as this goes further that we will see a drop in demand and uh, as Neil mentioned earlier, are planning accordingly. Exactly when that hits and how deep it hits, uh, no one knows. But uh, we are aggressively managing our uh, variable costs to be prepared for that, uh, as well as looking at the fixed costs. But uh, as of now, uh, yes, we've seen a bit of a slowdown, but it's uh, still uh, going reasonably well. Got it. Thanks for the caller. Um, um, uh, Neil, a question for you, uh, probably a little early, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, can you provide us your thoughts on uh, the need for near-term capital preservation versus your maybe initial thoughts on long-term basis for capital deployment ideas on buybacks, uh, m and uh, versus dividends? Yeah, sure. The, um, um, as I started to detail in our comments earlier, Deepa, we are – um, we feel really good about the, the strength of our, of our balance sheet entering this. And as we've stress test the, the, the model for the company through this period, we are, you know, obviously building up from, from cash uh, forward. And as Karen mentioned, we have access to, um, to uh, significant additional liquidity. So we feel like uh, we're as well positioned kind of going into this as we possibly uh, can be. As we think about kind of what we're going to do with cash uh, in, the, in the intermediate and then longer term, first on the, uh, you know, kind of intermediate term, obviously we're going to, um, we, we, need to we need to mind our knitting and, and take care of ourselves first. So we need to make sure that we stay liquid, we stay, um, we stay as well positioned as we can. Then as we, um, as we look forward, we're, um, we're obviously going to be paying attention to, uh, to how this impacts other, other companies in, in our business and the ones 
adjacent to us to, uh, to understand kind of where they are. We'll be mindful of, of, our, um, of our own company's uh, value and performance, but, uh, but our bias for the long term is that, um, is that we believe we have a, a highly efficient cash generating business which returns higher returns on invested capital, and we'd like to use that capital, we'd like to bias the use of that capital for growth, both through reinvestment in our, um, in our business as well as to, uh, to add adjacent businesses to, to great size of the company. Got it. Thanks very much. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Osborne with Cowan. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning. Uh, just two quick ones on my end. I was wondering, Neil, if you could update us on uh, the situation in Mexico and your manufacturing facilities there. Uh, any you know, reduction in throughput with uh, social distancing or how the facility in general is doing with some of the approaches that uh, Mexico has taken with, uh, with COVID-19? Yeah, sure, Jeff. Uh, I've been to have been down to Monterey uh, twice now. We started working on people flow and sanitation starting January 31st, and they have implemented a number of different uh, a number of different changes there so far. Uh, currently, all of our facilities are are operating there. We are meeting uh, we are meeting demand. Um, the the backlog and the and the activations there have been consistent with uh, with historical. Uh, performance, even as we've restructured the, the facilities, moved people apart, um, implemented everything from temperature checks to um, to increasing the size of the manufacturing cells there, so that we can um, we can uh, spread people apart while they're working, to changing the people flow so that um, cells don't come in contact with uh, the cells unnecessarily. So, for example, they all go uh, eat at the same table at lunch every day with the same people, so there, there's there's no overlap. So, so far, um, we continue to operate there. As you alluded to in your question, the situation in Mexico is evolving and evolving pretty rapidly. So, some of the other states in Mexico have implemented more stringent uh, Kind of stay stay at home or or um, or sheltering restrictions that has not yet happened in um, in Monterey. We're working with um, with the um, with the authorities there to to um, obviously we're an essential we're an essential business because you know you can't build any of the things necessary to get through this without lights. So we're um, we're continuing to work through that, and we're we have a we have a very constructive positive relationship with the authorities there to. Um, and our associates to to help make sure that we're doing everything that we can and we'll move forward. But you know, as you move, the context there is fluid. Uh, it continues to change, but as of now, we are uh, we're operating at uh, we're meeting demand there in Mexico. That's great to hear. Um, and then my second question uh, was around you know your approach to the, the monthly modeling and sensitivity. Um, not looking for what the specific figures are, but certainly. Uh, regional diversification is imperative to understand, you know, as it relates to the, an outsider understanding uh, what your exposure is to the current situation, let's say in April and the first half of May. And so can you just give us a sense of uh, context, you know, either for the last fiscal year or more recently, you know, what your, your mix is as it relates to, say, the state of California and the Northeast in aggregate? Is, is it similar to the, you know, GDP generation of America, two-thirds or so? Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of your regional diversification. Certainly states like Georgia uh, have, have just implemented measures relative to, to California being the first. So I'm trying to understand as we think about, in particular, this upcoming quarter, what your scope of, of, uh, of reach is on a diverse, diversified geographic perspective. Yeah, I'll start and then, um, and then I'll pass it to Ricky for, uh, for any additional color. Our modeling has been to be um, to be dramatic and to be relatively universal. So as we looked at it from a, from a build the company up perspective, we're um, we're looking. We we don't want um, we don't want we have not allowed precision to be the enemy of insight as we've done our um, as we've done our modeling. So we've assumed you know kind of the worst cases and worked our way back from um, from there. As Ricky started, and I'm about to hand off to him, but as Ricky alluded to before, our demand so far has not, um, has not obviously been the worst case, and we've seen it kind of roll through different areas of, of the country. I'm talking about demand, not the demand shock. So, Ricky, do you want to address kind of how that's happened and how you think about our, our regional diversity? 
Absolutely. Uh, we are, uh, Jeff, uh, pretty consistent, as you suggest, with the GDP around the country. I would say we may be a little, and I stress a little, I'm talking, you know, percentage points, a little less in maybe the very large urban areas and a little more, therefore, in the, in the rural uh, heartland type area. Some of that goes back to uh, the legacy of uh, one of our brands, our largest brand, Lithonia Lighting, uh, which was the best value in lighting and uh, does extremely well uh, throughout the country. And, and, uh, and our focus has been probably disproportionate there versus some of the more architectural higher end that would be bigger in the urban areas, think of New York City, Chicago, uh, and, and uh, L.A., and so forth. Having said that, we've done a lot to build out our architectural capabilities and so forth. So we're pretty close uh, to that. And, and, yes, we are seeing, as you would expect, in the geographies where they are having the most uh, uh, impact from this pandemic and are having construction sites shut down or uh, shelter in place and so forth. Those are the areas we're seeing a, a bit more of an impact than we are in, in other parts of the country. That's helpful. I appreciate it. Thanks, both. Our next question comes from John Walsh with Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Hi. Uh, good morning, and a uh, welcome to Neil. Thanks, John. Um, you know, I guess maybe coming at the uh, kind of the throughput and some of the variable cost uh, question from a different angle, can you talk about how you're managing your inventory levels or how you kind of plan to manage them in the coming months? Um, should we think that, you know, there will be kind of a drawdown on, on inventory as the demand outlook is a little bit uncertain or, um, you know, any color you could provide there as we think about, you know, how it relates to, to free cash flow in the coming months as well. Yeah, sure. That's a great question and one we've spent a fair amount of time on. So, um, so again, I'll start and then uh, Ricky, uh, jump in if, if you uh, feel like you want to add something. But um, because there are two things going on here, there's the, the, there's the, the the impact of this rolled through first the supply shock as um, as Asia and China specifically started to shut down, and then there's the um, the which are, some of which the impacts of, are continuing, and then there's the how long does this last, and and um, you know how do we smooth our production and such through this. So I think kind of maybe three big buckets there. The first is on um, on Asian finished goods inventory. We have um, we have been we have been pretty consistent about maintaining that that supply so that um, so that we can uh, make sure we're in the market with those products um, over the last month and we'll continue to do that over the next um, the second is that we've been aggressive about making sure that we have access to uh, necessary components for our other products so um, so the um, and where we might have been, um, we might have been easing back on inventory in preparation for this. We've made sure that we have uh, we have supplies uh, there, not in an irresponsible way, but in a way that to make sure that we're available to the market and we come through this both through this and after this as the as the supplier that the market can count on. And then finally, the uh, the production uh, and, and management of our production efforts. We still manage, as you know, a full base system. So we are we are um, we are building uh, to demand there. So we're modulating where the inventory uh, the inventory levels as they uh, as they come through that. But but basically, we we are um, we are building to demand. Ricky, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just stress that uh, yeah we are pretty far in our lean journey, particularly in the supply chain. Uh, virtually all of our inventory, both uh, components is, and finished goods, is on Kanban. So as Neil rightly explained, very much a, a pull base. So as we see uh, demand slow down, it will automatically uh, slow down the purchasing of components and finished goods to match that demand. Yes, we do a little bit of oversight on that as we know of big projects or, or uh, spikes that uh, may come into that. Uh, but uh, 
it, it works really well. We're well tied into our supply base. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm confident that we will be able to continue to aggressively manage this inventory during this time frame. But we do, as Neil said, want to take advantage of our size and scale uh, to be that supplier that people can count on uh, if the rebound comes back uh, very quickly uh, or, as we're seeing, there's critical demands, whether it's for mobile health care facilities or, or uh, uh, infrastructure projects and so forth, that we can be uh, a 